All right, good morning, Bridgeport. How is everyone doing today? Yeah. Um, can everyone hear me in the back? Robert, can you hear me? All right, beautiful, beautiful. Um, welcome to Park Community Church. Uh, if we have not met before, my name is Kevin. I am one of our band leaders here. And uh, if you are new, if you are here for the very first time, welcome. We invite you as our guests to enjoy our service. Please help yourselves to some refreshments and coffee in the back set up by our lovely Connections team. That is for everybody. Um, if you are uh, ready and able, I invite you to stand with us as we begin in worship today. Um, two Sundays ago, uh, uh, I'm sorry, last Sunday, uh, Kenson uh, preached about true repentance as one of the main themes of his sermon. And we're going to start with a song that talks about true belief and true repentance and just being able to approach the throne even though we are sinners, um, just uh, in that state, in that posture of true belief and wanting to be truly repentant. So uh, I invite you to stand and sing with us. Come ye sinners. Not suffice, low incarnate. 
for it. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as sinners, and we thank you so much that you allow us to approach your holy throne in that manner, that you allow us to come as we are, Lord. So we are here today as we are with, with all of our sin, all of our baggage, our distractions, everything that we've been struggling with this past week, and we lay them down at your feet in true belief of who you are and in true repentance desiring to be washed clean, Lord. Be with us here today. Be with us as we worship and as we hear your word. We love you, Lord, and we give you all the honor, glory, and praise. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Um, so before we continue, um, for a few months, um, we are going to involve our Luke reading plan that, we are, that some of us are doing on our own um, into the beginning of our worship services. So um, this is a passage that Kenson preached on two weeks ago. Um, it is a passage that came up earlier this week in our Luke reading plan. So um, let me just read it for us, and then we will continue in our worship. Luke 2, uh, 43 to 49 says, And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And I'll jump ahead. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? So let's let her enter into God's house with that same attitude, that same posture. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day.
that again.
praise you we thank you we long for that day when death will be no more we can stand face to face with you who died and rose again help us to have eyes of eternity help us to look ahead with confidence and with joy and with hope Jesus we love you we worship you Holy Spirit, be with us, unify us, teach us, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to Park Community Church Bridgeport. My name is Jen Alvarez, and we're happy to see you here today. Let's take a moment to greet our neighbor. This is the first week of fall, so why don't you tell them either your favorite fall activity or maybe a fest or an event that happens in the fall that you love to um, join in. So turn to your neighbor, we have a few minutes. Okay, let's come back together, find a seat, grab a hot cup of coffee, or cold while it lasts. Again, welcome, my name is Jen Alvarez. We're so happy to have you today. Here at Park Community Church, 
we are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people until there's no place left. If you are new here to our campus, you'll see on every few chairs there's a welcome card. Um, we would encourage you to fill that out, turn it into the connect bar in the back, and let us get to know a little bit about who you are and how you came to worship with us. And either our head pastor here at Bridgeport, Kenson Lamb, or our elder, Paul Boy, will reach out to you and grab a cup of coffee. They'd love to get to know you better. For announcements, we have upcoming the Bridgeport Retreat. Thank you. Um, we do this annually. We did it last year um, as our first year returning back from the pandemic. It's a great opportunity, either if you're new here or you're a regular attendee and a member, to get together with our campus um, and the Hyde Park campus as we head up north to Wisconsin for a weekend of praise and worship uh, with our own Park Campus community. Um, some important things to note is there's a QR code for you to register and registrations will stay open until either it's full or October 29th, whichever comes first. There is childcare available. And it's also important to note that if this is a financial hurdle for you to attend, there are scholarships available. So there's um, a contact person from our campus on there, Nicole too, you can reach out to her. Um, we don't want that to be a limitation to you attending the retreat. Now I'd like to invite up um, Kevin, who's going to talk to us about the upcoming outreach opportunity for Trunk or Treat. Come on up, Kevin. Uh, my wife Abby and I are going to be helping coordinate the Trunk or Treat event this year. Uh, so if, if you don't know what that is, you're probably new here because we do this every year and it's kind of a big deal. Um, but, you know, for, I'll kind of run through it just so you have an idea of what it is. Uh, like the name suggests, Trunk or Treat is basically trick or treat, but in a parking lot. And uh, every year, this is, a, this is Park's kind of biggest outreach event of the year. We get hundreds from the neighborhood out to participate in this. So it's a great way for uh, Park to kind of show up and serve and love on the neighborhood. And uh, as Kenson said, get street cred. Um, so... Uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's it's really cool. There's like a, we rent out a parking lot, and then there's every space is kind of decorated with a theme, and there's an activity that the kids can go and and uh, participate in and get candy as well. So um, if you're interested in participating, we definitely can't run this event without help from all of you as volunteers. So there's a couple of ways that you can get involved. Uh, number one, we definitely need people to help decorate the parking spaces. So if you want to hit the next slide. Uh, you can see some examples of what's been done in the past. Um, a lot of like Marvel themes and video game stuff, stuff the kids love. Um, but we definitely need a lot of people to come out and decorate these spots. Uh, if you don't have a car, that's totally fine too. You can just decorate the parking space without having the car. That's totally cool. Um, so aside from that, we also do need a handful of folks to do greeters, uh, just to you know, kind of welcome people in and direct traffic and that type of thing. Uh, and then last but not least, we definitely do need a ton of candy. Uh, so if uh, that is a way that you think you can help out by donating treats, uh, we welcome that as well. So a uh, couple different ways you can sign up. Well, actually just one way, there's one form, but it's in a couple of places. So if you go back to that slide, there is a QR code that you can scan. Uh, it is also in the Facebook group. Uh, Nicole posted a link to the Google Sheet, and it's also in Kenson's email. But if for some reason you can't, find any of those or don't have access to it, Abby and I will be in the back after service today. Uh, we can help you sign up and we can also answer any questions that you might have. So uh, yeah, really excited for this and hopefully uh, we will see you, most of you guys there. All right, you can take that with you. Thanks, Kevin. So that's a great opportunity for us to serve the community here locally. And now I'm gonna invite up Sam Ryman who's gonna talk about an opportunity to serve globally. Hey church, uh, my name's Sam. I'm usually in the back. You guys normally don't see me up here, but I know where they keep the boy band mics, so I get the fancy mics today. Um, hopefully by this time next week, barring any flight delays or anything like that, I'll be in Thailand. I'll be, I'm going to Thailand with the same organization I went to uh, Spain last year called Reach Beyond. And 
I'll be going to Thailand to help a full-time minister, uh, missionary rather, uh, set up a training space and a repair shop for a bunch of radio stations in the Asia Pacific region. Um, last time I went to Spain, I was helping set up an outdoor kitchen. I was uh, serving in a church with their sound system. It's kind of what I do. Uh, so I really could use your help in prayer next week as I go for two weeks, but I also am very close to meeting my fundraising goal. There's information on, this, uh, on the QR code on the slide. And I'll also be around after service if you guys have any questions, comments, or just like want to share any stories uh, with about Thailand or anything in that region. I'm looking forward to it, and I can't wait to tell you guys all about what I experienced. So, thank you. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> now we'll enter into a time of giving. As you can see here on the slide, there are multiple ways to offer up your finances and resources to God in order to help um, enable and send out some of these really awesome opportunities that God has provided us um, just here through Trunk or Treat or even through Sam's upcoming trip to Thailand. If you'll now bed, bow your head and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these opportunities to serve our community regionally through the Trunk or Treat outreach during Halloween, and for our volunteer leaders, Kevin and Abby, who have generously given of their time to help organize this event. And we thank you, God, for enabling Sam with a very special skill set and sending him across the globe to Thailand, where he can share his skills with those in need of support. Father, be with us as we go out to serve your people, both locally here in our neighborhood and as we go abroad, and encourage us to be bold in proclaiming the gospel. It's in your name we pray, amen. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, if I am a new face for you, my name is Pastor Rafe Chenery. I'm the pastor over at Park South Loop. And uh, about once a semester or so, Kenson and I swap pulpits. So Kenson's over at South Loop right now preaching to the South Loop crew. I'm here with you. And uh, thanks for uh, letting us have Kenson for the day. Uh, one more quick plug, Kenson, I want to make sure I shared with you. Uh, South Loop, Bridgeport, and Hyde Park are coming together for a night of worship. Uh, we do this quarterly. It's a really important thing. Uh, and, and the goal of these nights is to just have a space to linger in prayer, to saturate ourselves just in coming before God with no rush, just lingering in worship and prayer. Uh, I think on there it says from 6.30 to 7. That time is actually wrong. We normally go a little over an hour is how long it is, but it begins at 6.30. It'll be here uh, up on the third floor uh, at, your, at your bridge location up there. Uh, and so I'd love for you to be there. My folks will be there from South Loop. Hyde Park will be joining us. Again, we do these quarterly. I think this is an important part of the life of the church. And so please be with us. Last night, I, uh, I had an interesting experience. I had my 20-year high school reunion. So you can all figure out exactly how old I am. But I had my 20-year high school reunion. And uh, it was really interesting. A lot of faces I hadn't seen in a long, long time. Uh, some folks who I didn't remember who they were, but they remembered who I was, and I was in good conversations with them. Uh, but a lot of old friends, a lot of old memories. I was thinking as I was driving out to Oak Brook last night to go see everybody, and one of the things that kept coming across my mind was, man, I got a lot of things I'm kind of not too proud of from my high school days. I was driving out there, and I, I'm just driving, I'm like, man, I wonder if this person's going to be there, because, you know, I wasn't the nicest person to them. And it, God gave me the courage to say I'm sorry for some of the things I did when I was in high school. And then I was driving, I'm like, man, I wonder if anybody remembers, remembers that incident or that incident. I'm like, oh, what are people going to think about me when I get here? It's interesting. I had a wonderful night. You know, most of the people, that actually the people I wanted to say sorry to weren't there. Um, but have you ever felt like that? Have you ever kind of looked back on your own life? You look back on your 
your weak moments, and you kind of stand with a little bit of a shame over them. Um, you kind of hope that they don't get brought up because those weaknesses say something about you that you don't necessarily want shared publicly, shared broadly. Well, today we come to a really amazing passage, and frankly, it's a passage that uh, most of us probably would skip over if we were doing like a Bible reading plan, going verse by verse through the Bible. We might skip over these verses today. Uh, and we're going through the Gospel of Luke, and we're going verse by verse through the entire Gospel of Luke. And one of the benefits of this is that we don't get to skip anything, even the passages that maybe you might be fond of skipping over for the sake of time as you go through it on your own. And today's passage is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read this to us in just a moment here. And what it's going to be is just a list of names. It's the, the bloodline of Jesus. And I know for many of us, we might kind of gloss over this. What, what kind of, what do we draw out of this? What, what importance do we draw out of this? Well, well, I'm going to show us a handful of things that I think will, at the end, tie back to my opening story there of my 20-year high school reunion. But there's a lot of importance in here. And uh, I, one of the things I want to try to do for us today is give us a vision that every verse of the Bible is important. Uh, we are students not just of the New Testament, but we're students of the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we want to learn everything there is to know about every passage because it all has something to teach us in one way or another. And so today, I'm going to try to answer some questions like, why did Luke include the ancestry of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke? What impact should this text have on our life? And I'll draw out a few uh, uh, insights for us. So let me read it to us, and then we'll dig in. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathias, Mattathias, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Moth, the son of Math Mattathias. I'm going to have some struggle here, guys. The son of Semain, the son of Josek, the son of Joda, the son of Joanan, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of Almadam, the son of Er, the son of Joshua, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathoth, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Elachim, the son of Melea, the son of Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Selah, the son of Nashon, the son of Aminadab, the son of Admin, the son of Arni, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Anas, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Now, I think I get a few extra points for saying all of those names without stumbling too many times. There are some difficult ones in there. I want to draw out three insights for us from this passage. Again, a passage that we might skip over, but I think very important to us. Number one, why did Luke include this genealogy in the life of Jesus Christ? Well, first insight is this. Luke is demonstrating that Jesus has a legitimate claim to King David's throne. Luke is demonstrating that Jesus has a legitimate claim to King David's throne. Now, before you think that is not related to you or has no impact on your life, bear with me. I want to show you that it very much does. Now, Jesus, in the New Testament, we believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. In fact, the word Jesus Christ, Christ, Christ means Savior. It's the Greek term for the Hebrew term Messiah, Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So Christ wasn't his last name. That was an identification of who he was. Now, when we say Jesus Christ, the Messiah, what does that mean? What, what does it mean that he's the Messiah? Well, in the Old Testament, all through the Bible, before Jesus came, there were all these insights of to who the Messiah was going to be and what he would be like. And the Messiah would play a very, very important role. In fact, once the Roman occupation happened of Israel, the, the, the hope and the, the weightiness of wait, waiting eagerly for the Messiah, this individual to come, was just prevalent throughout Israel. 
And what really what they thought the Messiah was going to do is he was going to be the one, whenever the Messiah came, he was going to be the one to free them from Roman occupation. Israel would be their own nation again, and I have no Roman rule over them. But the Old Testament was written a bit cryptically, to be honest with you. When it comes to what the Old Testament thought about what the Messiah would be like, it's a little bit how in the New Testament we oftentimes discuss and debate what the end times will be like. And one of the reasons we discuss and debate that among very faithful, smart followers of Jesus is because there's a little bit of crypticness about how the end times all work out. There's a, there's a bit of mystery. There's a lot of details that are given, but we're not certain on how it all pieces together. One of the reasons I think that the Father, when he had the writers of the Old Testament n write the Old Testament, one of the reasons I think he left it a bit mysterious about all the details of the Messiah, honestly, I think it was, was so Satan wouldn't have the exact playbook. Because if Satan knew if he were to kill the Messiah that he'd rise from the dead, I don't think Satan would have gone about the business of trying to kill Jesus. And so some of it was a little cryptic. There was a bit of a mystery to this, and yet we know a lot about what the Messiah was. What were some of the common expectations? Well, you've heard some of this before, I think. Number one, we knew that the Messiah, the indicators of who he was, he'd be born of a virgin. Born of a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 in the Old Testament. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel. A woman who had not slept with a man was going to get pregnant, have birth to a son whose name meant God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. Now that's an incredible, hidden yet beautiful prophecy. But before Jesus, I wonder what we would have done with that. His, his name will be Emmanuel, God with us. Does that mean God literally with us? Does that mean God will be upon this person in a particular way, but he's not actually God? You could see how that would be a little mysterious. And yet they would have held to this hope. He'd be born of a virgin. That would be a sign. Second, Jesus would, the Messiah would come on a certain timetable. If you were with us when we studied the book of Daniel a few years ago, uh, actually, this is one of the more amazing prophecies in the Old Testament. There was a timetable when Jesus would come. We know from Daniel chapter 2 that the Messiah would come right in the midst of the Roman Empire. Isn't that incredible? We know that hundreds of years before the Roman Empire was ever even a thing, the prophet Daniel said when the Messiah comes, he's going to be right in the midst of the fourth empire of that statue, which was the Roman Empire. And then in Daniel chapter 9, we read this. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem, that's an actual date we have. We know the exact date of that. To the coming of the anointed one, as to the coming of the Messiah, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. Now I'm not going to do all the, the crazy Bible math for you, but that date works out to what we celebrate as Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem. Incredible. There was a timetable for when the Messiah would come. Number three, we knew about the Messiah. What was our hope about what he would do? Well, he would be a suffering servant. The great chapter of that is Isaiah chapter 53. If you want a great Old Testament passage, just linger in Isaiah chapter 53. I've seen people who are Muslim and Jews come to faith in Jesus because of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Incredible language. That actually sounds a lot like crucifixion. He was pierced for our transgressions. A bit mysterious of language, but you could see what God might have been hinting at there. Upon him, or he, through his chastisement, he brought us peace. This sounds like the gospel, doesn't it? Jesus crucified in order that we could have peace with God. Again, in Isaiah 53, 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was, he, put him, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's saying, after he's made an, an offering for guilt, after he's been killed, he will see life again. He will resurrect. It's saying the resurrection's going to happen before he ever actually resurrected. These are incredible details of the Old Testament that Jesus lived out perfectly. Now, what's my point I'm making at here? Where I'm trying to give you a picture of what the Messiah would do and what was hinted at. And you can imagine the people of God in the Old Testament days waiting for this Messiah figure, this mysterious one who would be Emmanuel, who would deliver them, who would take, their sin, take his sin upon his shoulders. Well, one of the prophecies about the Messiah, very specifically, was that he would have to be a son of King David. Very important. 
son of King David. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, this is to King David, I will raise up your offspring after you, says God, who shall come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, David's son Solomon established a house for the name of the Lord. He, he built the temple in Jerusalem, the ruins of which one, well, it got ruined and then they rebuilt it again. But on that spot, you can go to Jerusalem and see it again today. But his throne didn't last forever. His throne was taken away. He was a polygamist, made a lot of mistakes in his life, and the, the, the kingdom got torn in two after Solomon's reign. But one from the line of David would come who would have a throne forever. The people of God in the Old Testament days were waiting eagerly for that, that one from the line of David. Jeremiah says something similar, very similar to what Isaiah says. I, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't oftentimes tell you about the Hebrew terms on things, but this is important. The righteous branch, the word branch in Hebrew is nazar, and Jesus was known as a Nazarite, a Nazarite. I think that's a title of Jesus the branch. He's the fulfiller of Jeremiah 23, verse 5. God will raise up a righteous branch. He will reign as king and deal wisely, shall execute justice. And where will that branch come from? From the line of David. Now, why is this important? In our genealogy today, right in the middle of it, we see who in there? We see King David. He's right there for all to see. Not just any David, but David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed. Right? The, the, this is very clearly Luke and the New Testament writers, Matthew, who also gave a genealogy of the life of Christ, is saying to anyone who will read it, Jesus did not just claim to be the Messiah. He had the bloodline that was required in order to fulfill that role. He was a direct descendant of King David. Now, the people of Christ's day thought that the Messiah, when he came, would free them from Roman occupation, the tyranny of Rome. Jesus did deliver them from a tyranny, but it was a far greater tyranny than the tyranny of Rome. When the Messiah came, he did something that no one expected. He established a spiritual kingdom that does rule and reign right now, but the freedom he brought was from a spiritual tyrant that was holding us in bondage to sin. And when you place your faith in Jesus, you're freed from that bondage to sin. The same way that they would have hoped they were freed from the Roman tyranny, the Roman oppressors, from Caesar, were freed finally. Jesus has set us free from the tyranny of sin in our life. We're going to come back to that theme in just a little bit in just a little bit, but I want you to linger there for a moment. The Messiah, the Savior, he saved us from what? He saved us from our own sin. He saved us from the wrath of God. That's who Jesus is. Christians, set your gaze on the legitimate heir to King David's throne. Stand in awe at King Jesus, the King of kings who calls you his own. We need to give him our highest allegiance. A second insight from this. Luke demonstrates that Jesus is a global Savior, not just a Jewish Savior. Okay, I know these, these first two are a bit impersonal, but I, I, we need to actually understand this from the, from the Gospel of Luke, what he's trying to say. Jesus is a global Savior, not just a Jewish Savior. Now, that might sound obvious to our ears, but it wasn't necessarily obvious to the first century readers, who many of them were Jewish. A little bit of a backstory for you. When, when the Jews, the people of God in the Old Testament, the Hebrews, what, what was their mission? If you go back to the, or, the original like, days of the people of God, what, what were they trying to do? Well, you go back to Genesis chapter 12, God called out from among the nations. If you remember, the Tower of Babel happened. This is early in Genesis. The nations, 70 nations, were then spread out from the Tower of Babel, all of them pagan, all of them under demonic spiritual forces, worshiping false gods. God calls out one man, Abraham, who was a pagan, and he brought him to faith in the one true and living God, God Almighty. And in Genesis chapter 12, God said to Abraham, go from your country and kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I'll make of you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great so that, this is so important, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What was God's plan for the people of God in the Old Testament, for the Hebrew nation. Well, 
it was that all the nations, the disinherited nations from the Tower of Babel, all the nations that had fallen into pagan idolatry and into brokenness and sin and darkness, one nation would arise from them. And as they lived their lives wholly unto God, as they raised up generations of children to know and love the one true God, as they established laws for their nation that the other laws could look in, the other nations would look in and say, that is a righteous nation. They have laws that are not like ours. They, they, they honor each other, and whatever's happening in there is right. That was what Israel was supposed to do. And they had seasons where they did it very well. They had seasons where they did it very poorly. But on the whole, if you've read the Old Testament, you know they failed. They ended up living just like the nations around them. In fact, before they were, before they were sent into exile, Israel had so fallen from their righteous calling that they were doing some of the, the most atrocious evil sins that their surrounding nations were also doing. They were sacrificing living children, a sign of a a completely corrupt nation. Israel was doing what the surrounding nations were doing, and eventually God sent them into exile, punishment for what they were doing. Now, God's plan never changed. What was he trying to do from the beginning? He established a nation. Through them, all the nations would be blessed. Well, What is this genealogy uh, saying? If you compare this genealogy to Matthew's genealogy, in Matthew, I think it's chapter 1, right at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, there's two genealogies. Matthew's goes all the way back to Abraham. He stops at Abraham. Am I right on that? He goes right back to Abraham, who was the father of the Hebrew nation. He was the father of the Jewish people. And so for Matthew, what he's saying is that Jesus is a truly Jewish Messiah, He comes right from the line of Abraham. But Luke goes further. Luke then adds all the names that connect Abraham all the way through Noah, all the way through Seth, unto Adam, who was the father of all humanity. Every nation ultimately descended from Adam. And what is he communicating here? He's saying, look, the Messiah, the hope that Israel was supposed to do that was originally what God was going to do in the original plan before sin ever came into the world to bless all of the world, God is doing through this Messiah. He traces his roots all the way back to Adam. R.C. Sproul, a wonderful theologian who passed away a few years ago, he comments on this. He says this, Luke is showing the universality of the mission of Christ. Jesus Christ is not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles, for the Romans and the Greeks. Jesus is the new Adam, the author of the new humanity, the one who comes to redeem and to reconcile men from every tribe and nation, not merely giving himself as a ransom for the lost sheep of Israel, but pouring out himself as a substitute for the sinful children of Adam's race. If you're, a, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been caught up into what Jesus is doing, winning the nations back to his throne. You need, we need to understand world history. We, we oftentimes see world history as distinct from the Bible. In fact, world history is what the Bible says it is, and what is happening right now in the world is that Jesus has established his throne He defeated sin, Satan, and death. He seated it at the right hand of the Father. And history is going according to one single trajectory. Everything that happens accomplishes ultimately one thing. And that is that the King of Kings, who's sitting on his throne, who will return one day, is currently gathering his church, his elect, from the corners of the world. And the church is marching triumphantly in the power of Jesus into places of darkness to establish outposts of light where the gospel can go forward so people can meet Jesus. Why is Sam going to Thailand? Why is he going to Thailand? I lived in Thailand. The reason he's going to Thailand is because the gospel has not yet gone forward. And he's got to go, go work with folks who are there to help the gospel, what Jesus is doing, bringing the gospel to the nation so that they can be won back to his name. He's going to bring them assistance. Now, what do we take from this? Jesus is a global savior. I, if you know my family, you know me. I have, two, I have three, three daughters, uh, one of them biological, two of them adopted. The two adopted daughters are African-American. And uh, when we first adopted them, when they first got into uh, preschool, all they knew at that point is that their dad is Italian and British, okay? That's me. I'm Italian and I'm British. That's what I am. And one day, they're sitting in preschool, and uh, the teacher asks this sweet little innocent question to the preschoolers, you know, do you you know where your family's from? 
And my sweet little joy bird, she raised her hand. She goes, well, I'm Italian and I'm British. And you can just imagine this, this sweet little preschool teacher's delight at seeing this little African-American girl say, I'm Italian and I'm British. And I heard the story from the teacher afterwards and got a little chuckle out of it. But there's something significant about that that's something for us to touch on here with this. She believes that she is Italian and British. <laughs> now, obviously, there's work we have to do as parents and, and helping her adjust to who she is and her full identity and all that. But in her sweet little childlike faith, that's who she is. That's the story she's been adopted into. My family's story is her family story. I've got a, I got a thing in my house. There's a big page that, that lists the name Chenry, where it came from. And one of my favorite parts is that we come from Vikings. I, I, love, that. I love that part of my story. Somewhere along the line, we were, we were associated with Vikings. And, and I love just going through, where did I come from? Who am I? This is your story, Christian. We don't skip over this. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are grafted into the family of God. You were grafted in. You who were from the pagan nations, you're Gentile, unless you were born Jewish, which some of you might have been. We have a few Jews who were born Jewish, who are Messianic Jews in our congregation at South Loop. But the majority of you are from the nations. And this is now your story, who you are. You, 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 have, you have brought on the story of Abraham. That's your identity. You brought on the story of Jacob. You brought the story of King David and of Solomon and of Boaz and Ruth and, and Joseph and Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. That's not someone else's story. That's your adopted family story, and therefore it's your story. One of the questions I have for you is do you see that as your story? Your story should be like a coat that you put on you. You just you wear it, and th this is you've wrapped yourself in an identity wrapped up in who you are in Christ. And if your faith is in Jesus, your story is connected deeply to the Old Testament saints. You've been grafted into that family. Do you know that story? Do you delight in that story? Do you recognize that's your family? Jesus is not just a Jewish savior, he's a global savior. But here we go, number three. Luke demonstrates that God uses very broken stories for his glory. God uses very broken stories for his glory. You know, a lot of the names on this list, we have no idea who they are. This is the only time they ever come up in Scripture. We don't know them. Because the Jews in the Old Testament were unbelievable scribes, this was not uncommon to be able to trace your family lineage. The Jews in history were the, the greatest scribes and transmitters of oral tradition in history. No one comes close. They were the best. And I think God particularly anointed them for that role so that the Scriptures would be preserved. But... We don't know all these stories, but we do know some of them. A lot of them are filled with all kinds of brokenness. Noah, for example. You know, Noah did some amazing things, but we know the story of Noah getting drunk after he finally landed on earth. There was some brokenness there. Lamech, that guy boasted about murdering men. How about King David? You know King David, the one who we're celebrating, that the Messiah would have to come through this man? What did King David do? Well, he had incredible high points. He slew Goliath. He, he, you know, he, he exhibited a tremendous amount of faith. But we all know David's downfall, don't we? We know the story of David and Bathsheba. David's men were off at war. David's strolling along the top of his palace in Jerusalem, which you can imagine the scene because the palace was the highest point in Jerusalem, and all the king's closest friends lived in houses, and the houses got very hot during the day, so they had these open courtyards in them, and the only person that could look in the courtyard was someone who was walking on the top of the palace. All the men are supposed to be gone. Bathsheba's out bathing in the open courtyard of her house, which should have been a very safe place to be, but King David's on his palace gazing down in the courtyards. Of course he's going to see a woman bathing in her courtyard. That's what they would have been doing when all the men were out of the town. That would be a safe place to be. David looks down, sees a woman bathing. It's not just any woman. It's one of his best friend's wives. Uriah was one of David's 30 mighty men. He, they, they camped out together under the stars. They fought together. They saved each other's lives in the battlefield. He looks down at the woman. He says, who's that? He knew who it was. His servant says, oh, that's Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. David, now experiencing temptation, the right thing to do when a man experiences temptation is to walk away, say, God, preserve me from experiencing this temptation. Instead, David looks to the servant and says, bring her up to me. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant. Talk about broken stories. 
Then David, feeling guilty about what he's done, realizing that Sheba's pregnant, he's going to get caught for having an affair. He calls Uriah back from the front lines to try to get Uriah to sleep with his wife. Uriah is an honorable man. He won't sleep with his wife while his men are dying on the battlefield. Plan A fails. So what, what does David do next? Well, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14, David sends a letter out to Joab, his commander of his army. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it by the hand of Uriah. Here, Uriah, take this back with you to the front lines. What does it say? Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. Uriah goes back to the battlefield carrying his own death sentence. One of David's best friends. Sure enough, Joab follows the command of the king and Uriah is killed. Why? So that David can marry Bathsheba and make it look like it's a legitimate child they had in wedlock. Despite all of this, God still used David to accomplish tremendous things. David had unbelievable scars. Well, we don't know every person's story. We do know a handful of these. And one thing they all had in common was that they were sinners. They were tremendous sinners. Even the best of them that had amazing stories of godliness in their life were sinners who lived in sin-filled worlds, and they, they faced all kinds of troubles and trials throughout their life, and they made tremendous mistakes. They had some good decisions. They had some wild mistakes. In one way, we might say they're a lot like us. They're sinners who lived in a sin-filled world who made a lot of mistakes. Now, I want to linger here for just a moment because I think one of the things we can take away from the genealogy of Jesus is you look at these names and you say, wow, like those are some bad guys in there. Lamech, he's one of the big top dog bad guys in the Old Testament. And you look at this and we begin to realize that God is even able to use our broken moments for his glory. And that is worthy of, of lingering on. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, it says this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Key words here. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Such were some of you. Like David, you've fallen short. Like Noah, I've fallen short. God's law remains the same. His law does not change. This is the standard of truth. He's God. He doesn't bow to whatever culture thinks is right or wrong. He's been the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His law will not change. Ten commandments still stand. They know exactly what is right and what is wrong. And God's standard weighs down over all of our life as the law, revealing our iniquity, revealing the shortness by which we stand underneath God's justice. All of us have fallen short of the, of, of the glory of God. And if we stand on our own, we will fall before God faster, faster than Goliath fell before God's anointed when he fought David. We will not last one second. His wrath will cut us down. But if you stand in Jesus, God then transforms your nature. Make sure you get this right. You're born into Adam. Every single human being, we're born into this lineage of Adam, the, who was the first man who sinned, and we're born with a corrupt nature. But when you believe in Jesus, you're given a new nature. And the new nature is in Christ rather than in Adam. What that means is for the very first time, once you put your faith in Jesus, everything about you changes from who you were to who you are. Your mind is changed. You don't think the way you used to, Christian. You used to have all kinds of thoughts that were dishonoring to God, but now, now that you actually, for the first time, have the ability, Christian, to think godly thoughts after God. Did you know that? That doesn't mean you always do, because your old flesh calls out to you. Think how you used to think. But now in Christ, you can think right. You can affect properly your affections. Before you knew Jesus, before you were in Christ, you had one way of thinking and it was not godly. You had one way of feeling and it was not godly, even on your best day. But in Jesus, if you've truly put your faith in Christ, you, you have chasms of your heart that are open to, to emote properly, to feel what God feels, to long for the great commission to be fulfilled. You can feel that for the first time because you're a Christian. You can relate to people the right way. You can see the world properly and objectively in light of the Word of God. 
Now, some of us, we make a big mistake with this. What's the point? God's able to use our broken stories and use them for His glory. Now, when we think about that idea, we get this wrong in a handful of ways, in two, two biggies. First is, a lot of us carry unbelievable shame over our former sins before we knew Jesus. I was going to this 20-year reunion yesterday, and what was I doing driving out there? I was carrying a lot of shame about some mistakes I made when I was in high school before I knew Jesus. And what I really want to say is I'm a Christian. I'm, it's not who I am anymore. I don't want to bring this stuff up because I carry shame about with it. When you carry shame with you, it ends up crippling you. It ends up behaving like a, one of those long ball and chains. You're trying to go through life, but there's this wrecking ball swinging backwards and forwards behind you, just kind of ruining everything in your wake, and it's destroying relationships that you're in out behind you. You may have outshined David in your corruption before you knew Jesus. You may have a lengthy rap sheet before the Father of exactly who you were and what you've done. But once you put your faith in Jesus, he sees all that and you are no longer judged according to those mistakes. You're judged according to what Christ has done and he perfectly obeyed the law and you're free in Christ. And what this allowed the Apostle Paul to do was to boast in his former sins. This is incredible. Paul, the Apostle Paul, actually looked for ways to say, this is who I was. I, I didn't just, I wasn't kind of like a godly guy who just needed a little bit more Jesus in my life. He, you should have known my corruption, says Paul. I, I, I was the chief of sinners. That's not pasted on language. That's coming out of a heart that truly looked into who he was before a holy law. And he knew exactly what, what God would have found him guilty of if he were to stand in front of the Lord without Christ on his side. Some of us carry shame around with us, and what that shame is, is we're not fully getting the gospel. I wasn't, yesterday, yesterday afternoon, as I was driving out to Oak Brook, I wasn't fully standing in the gospel. All kinds of shame was sweeping over me. Some of us don't have shame over former sins. This is heavier, and we're going to have a second piece to this in a moment. We have shame over current sins. Some of you are walking in, in sinful patterns. And the reason you know you're a follower of Jesus is because there, there's a deep battle inside of you over that sin. This is a mark of a Christian. You, you see sin and you hate it. And, 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 and you cry out like Paul cried out in, in Romans chapter 7, who will deliver me from this body of death? You see sin in your life and, and it's there. You know you fail at times. Not one Christian is perfect, but you're ashamed over the fact that you fail at times. And so what you do, what we do, when we come into a place like this, is we kind of give a version of ourselves that, that doesn't really talk about the ongoing struggle with our old nature that we all still live in. And then we rob the church of vulnerability. We rob the church of opportunities to share about Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter, six, Paul, or chapter 12, Paul says, but, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weakness. See, this is getting the gospel. The gospel doesn't say that God gets a hold of you and you're then some perfect, you know, you never make a mistake. The gospel says you have a new nature. You're going to struggle till Christ returns. But in that battle, watch Christ bring you victory over time. It'll happen slowly. It's this long trajectory. And, and Lord willing, in 10 years, you're not battling with the same sins that you're battling with now. It's a whole new host of sins that you're going to be working through at that point because God's doing a work in you. But, but don't hide this from the church. This is actually a chance to glory in the, in the goodness of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Now, some of us have a whole different mistake we make, and this one I'm more concerned about, and this is namely that, that we're not bothered over sin in our life. We look at stories like Lamech, we look at stories like, you know, the mistakes of David, and we say, well, they made mistakes, so... You know, I, I, bat, I, 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 I sin. And, and sometimes we, we cover it in Christian language to say, yeah, I'm battling with this sin. And there's no battle taking place. There's no hatred of the sin. There, there's, no, there's no crying out to God in the midst of our sin. There's no desire to mortify the flesh, to put to death the deeds of the flesh. It's just not there. And if there's no desire to get rid of the sin, if you don't look at your sin and cry out to a holy God in repentance, I have to ask the question, is the Holy Spirit inside of you? Because when you put your faith in Jesus, you were made a new person, and you were given the Holy Spirit to aid you in the journey of overcoming sin. The first person I described was battling with sin. 
And it was a struggle. We don't hold shame over that. We don't stand in that. We stand in Christ. Praise God. But if there's no battle and you're just good with sin but you're taking the title Christian, you haven't understood the gospel yet. The gospel is not license to go on sinning as if Jesus hadn't given you a new man, a new nature. The gospel is the death of sin in Christ. And you are called to a life of obedience, Christian. Joy-filled, hungering, zealous, righteous, biblical, Christ-honoring obedience. Hunger for it. Now, how do you know if this is true of you? And how do you know if you've experienced these things? Let me give you a little litmus test for you. Does your understanding of the gospel, I'm going to give you four, four ideas here. Does your understanding of the gospel include a deep inward sense of your own sinfulness? Honest assessment. When was the last time you were on your knees in your prayer closet saying, Lord, I'm a, I'm a sinner. I saw it in myself yesterday. I saw myself this morning. When was the last time you did that? If repentance is not a regular part of your practice, that's revealing something about your walk with God. What it's revealing is either you don't really honor God in all of His holiness, because if you did, you would hate your sin, or you haven't done enough theological reflection to really look in your own soul and ask God to reveal your sin, which is a problem as well. Number two, are there any areas of your life where you're just complacent with sin? where sin just has a foothold in your life and you're not battling at all. This is a problem. Don't leave here today that way. If you're a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, and you should not be able to sit underneath a sermon talking about the brokenness that people have and the, the grace that God gives to overcome sin and then walk away and be like, I'm just going to keep going the way I was going. Christians can't do that. We have the Holy Spirit. God's done far too much to leave you in your sin. Number three, do you carry shame around with you about your former sins? Are you fearful to share with other brothers and sisters in Christ about the mistakes you've made? I, I do. So if you're like me, then you probably do too. I think what this is an opportunity to do is to, is to pause on that for a second and say, wow, God, that actually is sin. That's, that's a misunderstanding of the gospel. I have not applied the gospel to the darkest parts of my heart yet. And I, I, I want to change. I, don't wanna, I want to live like Paul lived. Number four, very important here. Are you patient and tender with newer believers who are struggling with all kinds of brokenness? This is a very important mark of a believer. See, if believers are those who have looked inside their own souls and they see the depth of their sin, they understand it and they get the gospel, they get what it means that Jesus died on the cross for them, that, that, the, 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 that the blood that Jesus shed was the necessary payment for their own sin. If you get that, then when you see a newer believer who's still feeding on the milk of the gospel and hasn't gotten to the meat yet, and you see them making a whole host of mistakes, you can't look down your nose at them. You just can't. There's this unbelievable tenderness and gentleness that you have towards a struggling believer. When you see just a, a glimmer of the gospel in their life, Paul, Paul said, he said, I am like a, a nursing mother to my children. That's how he saw himself. Just wanting to, to tenderly walk alongside those who are young in their faith to bring them towards Christ. God's able to use even our brokenness for his glory. Church, in just a moment, you're going to have a chance to respond to this through worship. And I, I think if you get this, if you understand what we're talking about today, that Jesus, is, Jesus has a legitimate claim to the throne of David. And he's not just a, a Jewish savior, but he's a global savior. And he's active in that work right now. That's the work that you've been called into and that you are participating in here in the city of Chicago if you're a faithful follower of Jesus. That's your identity. It's what you're doing. And if you know that he's able to use your brokenness for his glory to bring about that ends, we got a whole lot to sing about, church. we got a whole lot to cry out to God about. Because he's not done. <laughs> your story's still being written. And there's a whole lot more to go forward with. Amen? Pray with me. Father, we love you. We worship you. Even from a passage like this that perhaps we've skipped over a number of times before, God, there's so much to learn from. And so we come before you right now. Holy Spirit, everything that was of you today that we've spoken of, would you seal this in our heart? Would we walk out of here being encouraged in the gospel of grace? 
For those that are in here feeling the conviction of the Spirit, perhaps they've never truly repented. Maybe they've understood the gospel to be something that does not involve repentance. Maybe they've understood the gospel to be something about Jesus and having him in our life, but never repenting underneath the righteous requirement of the law. I pray that right now in this room there would be true repentance. Those who are far from God, maybe taking the title Christian, but never truly repenting, that they would repent in Jesus' name and experience the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to lead them to all righteousness. And God, for those who've been walking for a long time with Christ who are in this room right now, I pray you do something new and wonderful in their life, deep in their resolve, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Rafe. Um, before we close out in a couple songs, um, I just I couldn't help but feel like, as, as he was closing out the sermon, that we should probably just take some time to pause, as he said. Um, I like self-assessment. I think that's um, a great way to put it. Um, he had a lot of good questions for us about just ways that we can assess. Um, and I think it'd be, we would be remiss if we didn't take just a moment to do that. Um, so, yeah, let me, let me just have us do that before we stand and respond. Um, you know, if, if I can share, I think for me, you know, the real heavy hitter question was what, what are those sins in my life that I'm not even fighting anymore? And, um, there was this, um, this intense moment of fear about what to say before we close out. Um, but I feel like... I feel like the right thing to do would be to really address that question and, and to, to share it with my family. And I know, I know what that is in my life. Um, maybe this is too personal. Maybe this is not a good look for, you know, the worship leader at your church, but so be it. I, I know for me that's just the, the lust and the impurity that has ruled my heart for so many years. Um, and, and I've I'm not naive enough to think that this little speech or, or 30 seconds of silence is going to change everything, but I do think, I do think it's a step in the right direction. Um, and so I hope that maybe this moment, just this little exercise, the self-assessment, as he said, um, is a step in the right direction for, for many of you that wrestle with some of those questions that he presented. So. Let me just give us a moment in silence, and then we'll, I'll, we'll stand and we'll close out together. Please stand with us as we respond to however it is that God has just been moving in your heart today through those questions and through his word.
Falling on my knees.
Church, let's remember before we close out, the stories we read in the Bible are still our story. Amen.
Amen. Now look up to me and receive the benediction. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of age. Go in peace, you are loved.